Pipes, and you're listening to Loafer's Glory, the Hobo Jungle of the Mind. We walked down the little roads in Cumberland and stooped because the sky hung down so low. We went by little rivers in a land just big enough, and no place that we went was far. The earth and the sky hung close and near, and the old hunger returned, the obscure and terrible hunger that haunts and hurts Americans, makes us exiles in our own land, strangers wherever we go. For I will go up and down the country and back and forth across the country. I will go out west for the states are square. I will go to Boise, Helena, Albuquerque, the two Dakotas, all the unknown places. Say, brother, have you heard the thunder of the fast express? Have you seen starlight on the rails? Yes, this is Utah Phillips, and this is Loafer's Glory, the Hobo Jungle of the Mind, a brand new idea for me. You know, at home I have a thousand field-recorded tapes collected over the years, an enormous pile of long-playing records, stacks of poetry, mouth full of words, that since I can't travel very much anymore owing to a heart condition, I'm going to try to purvey over the people's airwaves. I look forward to that very much, trying to do on the radio, what I had been accustomed to doing on the stage. My mentor on the rails was the great roadmaster from Portland, Oregon, a prodigiously great tramp, and I do mean a tramp. Like Ben Reitman said in San Diego many years ago, a hobo works and wanders, a tramp dreams and wanders, a bum drinks and wanders. Tramps are the intelligentsia of the traveling nation, conscientious malingerers, you might say, Suits me fine. A roadmaster, he was the best of me. He taught me things enduringly true. He taught me how to put rubber pockets in my pants so I can steal soup. His every utterance fraught with philosophy. He said to me, doesn't matter how you get there if you don't know where you're going. But the truest of the true, roadmaster said to me, and you pay attention to this, he said, never own anything you have to feed or paint. Now get that tattooed on the inside of your eyelids so you see it every time you blink. That's wisdom. Well, old Roadmaster is the last no longer winning among us. He bought the whole farm, committed suicide. A lot of these old tramps don't want to be thrown on public sufferance in the charity ward of a hospital, so they take their own lives. The usual tramp method for suicide is called a robicide, or death by exercise. But Roadmaster was bound to the railroad. It was his whole life. But the door is too high, the train's too fast. He was too old to catch on. He went out and laid down on the Amtrak line, starved to death. Listen to a song now that I made up for my older boy, Duncan. He lived down in Dallas, Texas. It was when he was a little kid, though, I despaired of him ever having a chance to ride on one of the great trains. It's a song I made for him called Daddy, What's a Train?
I was in Chicago, invited to play at a nightclub. Can you see me at a nightclub? <laughs> it was the old quiet night up on Belmont, Richard Harding's place. Stan Kenton had played there the night before, so I approached the whole proposition with some trepidation. I went in early to find out what was going on there, fought my way past the guard dogs up those dark stairs. It was a, an upstairs place. The janitor had taken the garbage out, and he was in there, the janitor by himself, in the, in the great dark hall on a high stage, sitting at a baby grand piano. He was playing the Moonlight Sonata softly to himself. He didn't see me standing in the shadows there. Then I looked closely and saw he was only playing with one hand. The right one was a stump off to about up the middle of his forearm. With that one good hand, he began to pound the piano, a great shock of white hair standing back on his head, deeply incised lines in his face. And in a rumbling baritone voice began to sing Freiheit, the song of the Tileman Brigade during the Spanish Civil War, the war that we should understand now, the one that if the United States uh, had gotten involved in it, there might not have been a Second World War. That was the destruction of the Spanish Republic by Franco and the fascists with the help of Hitler and Mussolini. Well, the fellow playing the piano was, was Eddie Belchowski, the janitor. He'd gotten the job there so that he could practice the piano, practice learning with one hand. Well, Eddie had been a concert pianist when he was a young man with a brilliant future. But then he went over to Spain to help preserve the Republic with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Crossing the Ebro River, he got his arm destroyed. They put him in a field hospital on morphine, which turned him into a junkie for all well, the next 30 years of his life. He haunted the skid rows, the alleys of Chicago, a mad poet, a mad pianist. He became, he became a good friend of mine, a good teacher. He taught me powerful things about endurance, about holding on and never giving up, never giving up. I left Chicago and went over to Rockford to play. I got a call from Ron Stevens, the manager of The Quiet Night, had told me Eddie Belchowski had died. So I sat down that night and I made him up a, a death song. A week after that, I got a call from Eddie. First thing I asked him was, Hey, Ed, where are you calling from? He said, Chicago. I said, Hell, dead or in Chicago. It's all the same to me, fella. And a week after that, I was sitting on a bar stool at The Quiet Night, quiet night with Eddie Belchowski sitting across from me. I had a chance to sing him his death song. He was amused. Well, it's not too long ago I got word that Eddie Belchowski at the age of 74 was found on the subway tracks in Chicago. So I can sing for him now Eddie's song.
Any song. You know, I can do on the radio things that I could never do on the stage. I always wanted people to have an opportunity to hear Ed Belchowski playing the piano. So you put yourself in that big empty room, standing there in the dark, looking at Eddie with just a nightlight on, uh, pounding on the piano. I have a tape his daughter sent to me of Ed Belchowski playing Freiheit on the grand piano. You listen to it. The international brigades that came to the aid of the Spanish Republic came from many, many different countries. But the first organized group to come to the aid of the Republic of Spain came from Germany, led by Ernst Thälmann. And this is the song of the Thälmann Colonna, Freiheit, Freedom. Fear on so glad you had a chance to listen to Eddie Belchowski play. You know, as the weeks progress, I hope to be doing this show for at least six months, once a week. I want to play more of Eddie Belchowski. I'd like to play you not just the songs of the Spanish Civil War, but a hand, hand, uh, list with left hand variations. He can play the Bach Chacon with one hand. And then all of his improvisations, which are so ingenious. Well, now, let's go up to Whitefish, Montana. And uh, the old... Uh, hotel there uh, that was run by Ralph Hahn Sr. Ralph Hahn Sr. was an old retired rancher that I knew some years ago. I met him at the World's Fair in Spokane, Washington. And he had a, ran the Hahn's Hotel up there uh, so his old cronies would have a place to winter in. And I would go up there on the freight trains and listen to them jawbone for two or three weeks and just uh, sit still and listen, first to the rhythm of the language and then to what sense there was in it. That's the first time I heard tell of Colonel Charlie Goodnight and Oliver Loving. So I made a song for Ranch Han for his birthday. Colonel Charlie Goodnight and Oliver Loving were pioneer settlers of the old Southwest and folk heroes, both of them. 
founders of the great Goodnight Loving Trail, the westernmost of the great cattle trails from El Paso, Texas, to Denver, Colorado, and a spur into Montana. In years past, you know, I've gone about the country talking about the egg setting horse and uh, Oliver's Outhouse, and if you missed that one, well, it's a rare beauty. We'll catch up on it later on. Well, Colonel Goodnight, though, was a true pioneer. He did his first trail drive at the age of 16, uh, out of, uh, from the old, old Jesse Chisholm's, Chisholm's trail. Jesse Chisholm was a black cowboy. They just don't tell you that in the, in the history books. Well, there were three months on the trail, finally got up to Topeka, Kansas, and uh, Colonel Goodnight, well, he hadn't had a good meal or a, or a decent uh, bath for uh, quite a long while, so he went and checked into the, the hotel, and he washed up, went down and ordered a, looked at the menu. Now, there were delicacies coming in out of the frontier that nobody had seen, uh, but the railroad had come in, and that's what brought them. He looked at the menu, and it listed turtle soup. Well, that made him curious. So he ordered a bowl of turtle soup, and he drank it, and he liked it. But then the waiter brought the check, and it was $4. Well, now, normally you charge a working cowboy $4 for a bowl of turtle soup, but he's going to knock the waiter down, hurl the chair through the window, fire a few loose rounds through the ceiling. But this was that pioneer mind. This was that, that native brilliance of Colonel Charlie Goodnight. He looked at that bowl said, one turtle, $4. He knew the South Texas Plains were covered with those big land terrapins, big land turtles. He got a crew together, spent three months rounding up 56,000 of those land turtles, drove them up north. It was the longest trail drive in the history of the Old West. Well, they, they kind of moved slow, and they drifted a lot. They had to turn them over on their backs at night so they wouldn't drift too far. They were a hell to rope they'd pull in their necks. Well, finally, the first river they had to ford, they all went to the bottom and never came up. And that was that for the great turtle drive of 86, but it was an altogether fine idea. Look, I don't make this stuff up. The song that I made up for Ralph Hahn Sr. was recorded by some friends of mine up in Toronto that well, I, I used to know years and years ago. It's the ve best singing of this song I ever heard, God knows mine included, because they sing it without any accompaniment. Here's a good night loving trail sung by finest kind. Too old to wrangle or ride on the swing. You beat the triangle and curse everything. If dirt was a kingdom, then you'd be the king. On the good night trail, on the loving trail. Our old woman's lonesome tonight. Your French harp glows like a lone ball in calf. It's a wonder the wind don't tear off your skin. Get in there and blow out the light. With your snake oil and herbs and your liniment too, you can do anything that a doctor can do. Except find the cure for your own goddamn soup On the good night trail, on the loving trail Our old woman's lonesome tonight Your French heart glows like a lone ball in calf It's a wonder the wind don't tear off your skin Get in there and blow out the line. The cook fire's out and the coffee's all gone. The boys are up and we're raising the dawn. You're still sitting there lost in a song. On the good night trail, on the loving trail. Our old woman's lonesome. Your French heart glows like a lone ball in calf. It's a wonder the wind don't tear off your skin. Get in there and blow out the line. I know someday I'll be just the same, wearing an apron and 
instead of a name. There's no one can change it. There's no one to blame. The desert's a book wrote in lizards and sage. It's easy to look like an old torn out page. Faded and cracked with the colors of age. On the good night trail, on the loving trail, our old woman's lonesome tonight. Your French heart blows like a lone ball in calf. It's a wonder the wind don't tear off your skin. Get in there and blow out the light. The Good Night Loving Trail. Well, now let's drop down to Santa Cruz, California. I, I had a good friend down there, lived in a flop house called the St. George Hotel, by the name of Tom Scribner, an old communist and before that IWW logging organizer. He was organizing unions of the unemployed in Oregon up till 1957, and he had joined the union in 1916. But Tom Scribner eked out a bare living on the street paying the musical saw and the gin mills, the pizza parlors, and he lived in that flop to St. George. He became a great teacher to me. Well, Santa Cruz honored him not only by putting up a statue of him in front of the St. George Hotel, but also by having the first national saw playing contest. And saw players from all over the country came, and a disparate bunch they were. One of them was an African-American gentleman uh, who is an a orthopedic technician from Brooklyn, New York, by the name of Moses Josiah. And he played the hammered. He hammered the musical saw. Well, I brought back some of his music. I've just been sitting on it for years. What are you going to do with something like that? But this one, this particular piece really caught my curiosity because what you're going to hear is, is Moses Josiah uh, playing, hammering the musical saw, playing Power in the Blood. And then in the chorus, he's going to be accompanying himself with the bowed musical saw. And And right after that, you're going to see that song... The Wobblies always liked to steal hymn tunes because they were pretty and then changed the words so they made more sense. That tune, Power in the Blood, was borrowed by the great Joe Hill, the Wobbly songwriter that was killed by the state of Utah on November 19, 1915. Um, and he, he, wrote a, he wrote, I think, Joe Hill's best song called Power in the Union. So you're going to listen to Power in the Blood, part of it, and then, and then I want you to hear... Oh, about a dozen IWW singers on the stage in Chicago at the at the old um, Holstein's Bar, where we all got together to record a record to, as a fundraiser for the industrial workers of the world there in Chicago. It was an odd engagement, too. It appeared as though in order to be able to do that, we were going to have to cross our own picket line. It was an odd state of affairs. Here's Moses Josiah and Power in the Blood.
day in Worcester, Massachusetts, called Alice in the Hat. And there was a fellow sitting next to me. I was working for the laborers' union. They were having a, doing a labor education program. And the television set was on, and Cesar Chavez was on the evening news leading that first big march in Sacramento. And this fellow who had been holding his union card for 26 years said, bunch of wetbacks, why don't they ship them back to Mexico, taking jobs away from American workers? And I could have got mad. Then I had to stop and think, well, what did he get in school? What did he get in his work experience? You know, what did he get even from his own union that gave him some tools to understand what it was he was seeing on that television? If he had grown up with a true and sure knowledge of who he was and where he had come from, he would have, he would have been a whole lot more pissed off than he was, and he'd have known exactly who to be pissed off at, too, I'll tell you that. Well, that's why we do these songs. These songs are a better and more accurate picture, idea, of who we are and where we have come from than the best damn history book that you ever read, you know? And like Claire Sparks said, a radical feminist in Southern California, said, uh, the long memory is the most radical idea in America. Would you have freedom from wage slavery? Then come join the grand industrial band. Would you from misery and hunger be free? Come on, do your share, lend a hand. There is power, there is power in a hand of working folks when they stand hand in hand. That's the power, that's the power that was ruled in every land. Your industrial union brand. Would you have mansions of gold in the sky and live in a shack? Away in the back Would you have wings up in heaven to fly And stay here with rags on your back There is power, there is power in man The working folks when they stand If for a change you'd have eggs and ham, come on, do your share, lend a hand. There is power, there is power in a band of working folks when they stand hand in hand. That's the power, that's the power that was true in every land, one industrial union brand. Well, if you like sluggers to beat on your heads, and don't organize, all unions despise. If you'd have nothing before you're dead, shake hands with your boss and look wise. There is power, there is power in a man to work in folks. Hi there, and welcome back to Loafer's Glory, the Hobo Jungle of the Mind, or my mind, whatever you choose. I'm going to take you to, to Mount Olive, Illinois. I was invited to sing in a graveyard there at a great gathering of people. Now, who of note in American history was buried in the Union Miners Cemetery in Mount Olive, Illinois? You know, there are some stories in this world, or some stories in this country that should be as common among young people as Paul Bunyan, Snow White, Johnny Appleseed. And this is one of those stories. Of course, they're not taught because we're not supposed to know about things like this. Well, the person buried there was a woman. Is that a hint? Her name was Mary Harris. Got it yet? Mary Harris Jones. Mother Jones. It's hard to... Imagine a life that embraced the presidencies between Andrew Jackson and Herbert Hoover. 
1830. She was born, died in 1930, lived to be 100 years, knew everybody. Uh, Powderly, the founder of the Knights of Labor, was was her best friend. Her millinery shop burned down in the Chicago fire. She was in her 40s when she heard Abraham Lincoln speak alive. She was one of the founders of the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW union that I've belonged to now for better than 40 years. But most of all, Mother Jones was the miner's friend, the miner's mother. When the when the strikes happened over there in Kentucky and West Virginia and, and the men were out fighting the goons and the gun thugs, Mother Jones had organized the women of the camps and led them with brooms and mops over the snow-covered game trails down into the mine camps to drive the scabs out of the pits. She went down to the, the great coal strike in southern Colorado, the Ludlow strike. It was about 1916. Now, Mother Jones was not an organizer. She was an agitator. Uh, and so the organizers hated her as much as the bosses did because she was just a wild card on everybody's deck, and nobody knew how she was going to deal herself. She was in the Union Hall there. Now, the, the governor had promised not to send in the militia, but he lied, and he did. When word reached the Union Hall that the militia had entered the coal fields, Mother Jones leapt up, leapt to her feet and said, let's go get them. And she charged out. She didn't look to see if anybody was following her. Nobody was following her. She just went up the road by herself and confronted the militia. This is a song that came out of that, written by a Oh, I think uh, 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 Labor Secretary um, for the Union over in West Virginia, a fellow by the name of Evans. Oh, the patriotic troopers come a marching down the pike, prepared to shoot the miners in the Colorado strike. With whiskey in their bellies and vengeance in their souls, they came prepared to shoot the miners full of holes. In front of those brave troopers loomed a sight you seldom see. Loomed? She was less than five feet tall, weighed less than a hundred pounds. You're going to look like that and loom. You better be somebody. In front of those brave troopers loomed a sight you seldom see. A great white-haired rebel woman whose age was 83. Charge, cried the valiant captain in awful thunderous tones. And the patriotic troopers charged and captured Mother Jones. What's well, great to be a trooper with a musket in your hand, prepared to do the dirty work the lords of wealth command. It's great to shoot a miner and hear his dying groans, but there never was such glory as that charge on Mother Jones. Yeah, Mother Jones. You know, if I don't get around to singing these songs, they, they vanish from my mind. But I have been looking forward to singing to you alive over the people's airwaves and not just playing recorded music. Well... Like old art theme in Chicago says, when your memory goes, forget it. Come along with me now with Hood River Blackie. Hood River Blackie was a, one of those tramps I love to sing about. I met him as a young tramp, when I was a young tramp. A bunch of us were jungled up in Grand Junction, Colorado, preparing to get on board a Denver, Iowa, Grand and Western freight train to head up through the Moffat Tunnel, punching the Great Divide down into Denver. This older gent, as we were sprinting for the train, saw a bunch of ropes and, and strings hanging off of my bindle, my bedroll, what he would have called a balloon because he spoke the old tramp parlance. And he said, you're going to get hooked on something, young fella, and drag considerable distance. So we both missed the train as it made me unroll my bedroll and do it up properly. That was Hood River Blackie. He was the keeper of records in the Hobo Convention, a Grand Duke uh, in the Hobo Convention, Brit, Iowa, just like I am. His self-appointed task was be to, to gather up the songs, stories, poems, anecdotes of the traveling nation and scatter them about like dry leaves for people to me to, like me to find and put back to work. Hood River Blackie, they were building the big railroad museum in Sacramento, California. And Blackie called him up and said, where there's trains, there's tramps. You've got to have a tramp exhibit. So they hired him to build it. That's tramping. Well, now you go in there, you see a little alcove off the main train room. There's an Erzatz hobo jungle with a live, a life-size paper mache tramp sitting there. I uh, used to have a little holographic projection on his face so you could see the lips move. When you picked up the phone for the museum ramp, that was Hood River Blackie talking to you because he recorded that before he passed away. In his later years, he had an old car or a truck because the trains don't go into the Apple Valleys. That's where he got his moniker, Hood River Blackie. 
So you have an old car or truck that's called a, a rubber tramp. So he wasn't using his bindle, his balloon. He, he, wasn't, he gave the museum his coffee pot and all of his junk. And uh, it's, it's, it's hanging in there. And you stop by and look at it. When I found out that Hood River Blackie had passed away down in 29 Palms, the, the winter camp, I went down to that museum. And I stood in front of all his stuff and I made him up this song, Hood River Roll On. Here you're going to hear it sung by... Uh, Kate Brislin and Jody Steckert because I heard him sing it in a dream and I sent it to him and they went ahead and did it. It was giving Kate and Jody that bunch of songs, some of which I'd never even written down, and they went ahead and, and did them as well as I think they can possibly be done. It was their, their album on Rounder called um, Heart Songs. 
I was on a mountain in West Virginia, down in Clay County. Uh, a little mountain festival called Pipe Stem, put on by Don West, the Georgia poet. An old, old man, a fine, fine poet. It was raining, and the local musicians were standing around under the eaves of the sheds, and they were playing the fiddles and playing the banjos. But then I noticed one at a time they began to, to put their, their instruments under cover, put them away, and gradually drift down to the parking lot, which was rapidly sinking in the mud. I was curious, and I went down to see what was up. They were all gathered around the open door of a step van, and there was an, an old, painfully thin gent sitting in there, sawing away at the fiddle, and that was Johnny Johnson, a man of considerable repute, legendary fiddler from uh, West Virginia. And I mean, folks, he wasn't plastered, he was stuccoed. This man was eight or nine sheets to the wind, but he played like an angel. He's one of those that left West Virginia to boom on the freight trains, to be a cabinet maker across the country. You know, those folks have such a profound sense of place back in a place like Clay, Clay County that it's real hard to come home. It's not like us Westerners who have a strong sense of event, but very limited sense of place. So Johnny Johnson was having a, a hard time re-entering that community. I love to listen to him play. I love to watch him. Well, I have some of his music. I want you to listen to uh, Johnny Johnson from Clay County, West Virginia, singing or playing Jimmy Johnson. <laughs> Johnny Johnson playing Jimmy Johnson. Oh, boy, from West Virginia, a place, a state where it takes three frogs to stay alive and two of them got to be doctors. Who was Bobo Belinsky? Who was Lenore Goldberg and her girl commandos? Thank God for Yuba Wazi. Or, uh, David Briggs assures me, my friend from Grass Valley, that it's Yuba Waza, and he read about it in one of his baseball magazines when he was a kid. Some sort of early uh, martial art. If anybody knows anything about Yuba Waza, I want to know about it, mainly because I could never come up with a reason not to know anything. Well, I'll tell you what those things have in common. Bob Bobo Walensky, Lenore Goldberg, that's our crumb. Zap Comics, Ace Comics, Underground Comics, Art Crumb, one of, one of God's own fools, bitten by the divine. Well, less commonly known is that Art Crumb was a fine four-string banjo player, had an enormous collection of 78 RPM records, and had his own band called the Cheap Suit Serenaders, made up of other musicians but also other underground comic artists. Let's listen to the Cheap Suit Serenaders doing Singing in the Bathtub. Thank you. 
Cheap Suit Serenaders. Boy, I love sharing the stage with them. They are live wires. Well, we're drawing to a finish here, but I don't want to leave you without playing you perhaps the most interesting, uh, beginning, ending the way that we began, the most interesting uh, railroad uh, piece that I ever heard in my life. We recently did a Lord Buckley Festival here in my home in Nevada City. I want you to listen to Lord Buckley, Buckley's Trans... Buckley's train. Well, look, I really enjoyed being with you. My name, by the way, is Utah Phillips, and I'm here at the studios of KVMR in Nevada City, California. And I've enjoyed sharing this time with you in the premiere edition of Loafer's Glory, the Hobo Jungle of the Mind. Look forward to passing time with you again when you come my way and I come yours.
I am done with great things and big things, great institutions and big success. I am for those tiny, invisible, molecular, moral forces that work from individual to individual, creeping through the crannies of the world like so many rootlets, or like the capillary oozing of water, yet which, if you give them time, will rend the hardest monuments of man's pride.